Hi there. In this short video, I'm going to show how the basics of creating gears like these in rigid body physics works. You can see I've got a few different gears types here. They're interacting with each other and we've got this sliding object here that comes down through them. And finally, they interact with some pieces of metal at the bottom there. So to begin with, let's just put a couple of gears in. I'm not going to create the entire gear train that I did there, but I'm going to show you how it's basically done. So to begin with, if we go to add mesh gear, and if we look from above, we can see we've got a basic gear. We can accept the defaults, or we can play around with some of the options down here. So we can change the number of teeth. I'm going to stick with the default of 12. Don't change anything or move this around until you're happy with your gear, because these settings will disappear. So we can change the absolute radius here. The base is literally the inner edge there. So I'm going to narrow that in a little bit. The dedendum is obviously the length of the teeth on the cog or the gear. We don't want them too long. The addendum looks to be how far it extends and you can go so far that it sort of crosses over itself. So we don't want that. But a little bit of an angle there is fine. Pressure angle itself. In fact, if we look at it from a different angle, you can see how the ends here are brought together by changing that pressure angle. So it's the angle of the face on each tooth. And then skewness, you can see it literally skews the gear. So we want that at zero at the moment. We don't want to go with anything too complicated for this demonstration. And conical angle, much as you'd expect, draws it in like a cone. And we'll stay with zero for now. Finally, crown literally makes it in towards a sort of crown effect. So you might want to use this option if you want to make a crown, but we'll have zero. So there's our basic gear. And in order to make things easier to see in the viewport, press N to bring up the right hand menu. And I'm going to turn on ambient occlusion there. And that'll just make some of the geometry a little easier to see. So if we come into the middle here, we just need to join those two faces. So right click with Alt and Shift pressed. And again there, press space bar and just say bridge. And we'll say bridge edge loops. And that's joined them together. I'm not going to go into a lot of materials, but we'll do a basic material for this cog. And we'll say new, we'll change it to glossy. We'll go with multi scatter and we'll give it a sort of yellowish color. And I'll put that into the viewport color as well. Then press R, X, 90, just so that it's facing us. So there's our first gear. And I'm going to put that up here somewhere. In a minute, I'm going to duplicate it. But first of all, let's give it a spindle. So I'm going to do Shift S and say cursor to selected. And then Shift A. And we'll add cylinder, rotate x90, scale it down till it's just a little bit smaller than the gear, but I'll make it slightly longer than it is with sy to scale on the y axis. And we can actually make that a little thicker. So just a small gap between the spindle and the gear. And we'll give that a material which we'll call steel, slight blue color, and glossy again with multi scatter. So right now when I press play, of course, nothing happens. It's just a model right now. So now if I select the cog, I'm going to come down on the left hand side to physics and I'm going to say add active. And if I press play, you can see it just drops through the world. Then I'm going to select the spindle and rather than active, I'm going to say passive. If I said active, you can see they just both fall away. One actually runs out of the other. So the spindle should be passive. So that means it influences things in the physical world, but it isn't influenced itself. It doesn't respond in any way. So you'd think that should make the cog hang on there. But you generally find they'll go running off. And I'm just going to make a small tweak to the rigid body world just to make it recalculate the physics. And you can see it's just flying off. One of the other things that you need to do is always apply rotation and scale. So I'm going to select my cog, Control A, and say rotation and scale and do the same with the spindle. And you can see it's still flying off. So let's now go to the physics options. So for the spindle, for the rigid body collisions, which is what this is all about really, we've got convex hull. That will generally be fine. If you select some of these other primitives, it will actually reduce the load on Blender in terms of the calculations it needs to make. Convex hull will be fine. If this spindle was moving, but still passive, so I'd animated it in some fashion, I would need to click the animated button there, but it isn't, so it's fine as it is. And then we'll come to the gear. Now we've got convex hull listed there. 
convex hull is a sort of simplified shape. It's unfortunate it doesn't really show what it is, but I think if you'd find that things like holes in it aren't represented by the convex hull. So for things that have got holes in them like that, especially holes that you're going to use, we need to select mesh, which makes Blender look at the entire shape of the object when it works out whether there's been a collision rather than a sort of average of the shape. And you can see, although it's not right, it's sort of working closer to how you'd expect now. It's hanging on there. Next thing we can look at is margin here. So this is how close one object needs to be to another before Blender starts to calculate that there has been a collision. In orthographic mode, you can see there is a gap all the way around. But let's turn margin down to 0 0.01. And now you can see that it's much more stable. It's not completely stable, but it's actually stabilized more. Effectively, the margin is a sort of, imagine an expanded version of the shape within which a collision is assumed. The margin of this shape was impinging on the margin of the spindle. So if we look at the spindle, there's nothing selected, but there's going to be a default margin on there. So if we turn this one on and press play again, we've got heavy jittering again. So now I'll put this one down to 0 0.01. And it's reduced. Now the temptation is just to stick it to zero. And that can work, but you will find, and it will give you an, a warning here, you can still get problems with zero. So you're better off, if you're going to have a margin at all, at least have a small margin. I'll just turn off collision margin on the passive one there. And you can see that's roughly working correctly. So friction and bounciness, literally bounciness, how bouncy the object is. I've covered this in other physics tutorials. And friction, how much friction there is, obviously. So I'm going to put this down to point 0.1. And you have to remember you've got two surfaces interacting here. So you need to do it for both of them. So I'm going to go over to my gear. And I'm going to set that one to point 0.1 as well. So it's not zero. Again, if you have zero, you're more likely to get uncontrollable action. And you can see even here, because I've reduced the friction, this cog is starting to actually rotate in this case. You've also got deactivation. My understanding of this is when enabled, if the movement speed or angular velocity falls below a certain point, Blender will just assume it's not really moving. So it will make it a little bit more stable. You can see there, the object is now stabilized. It's not stuck, it will still respond to physical impacts and things like that. But Blender very quickly just assumed it's moving so slowly that it's not worth making any more calculations. And certainly when you've got a bigger simulation, that's going to be useful. And you can apply damping to the movement of physics objects as well, which can be useful if it's getting out of control. And there are some other settings that you can use as well. So that's all very well. We've got a cog there. But I know it's not very stable and it's not certainly not fixed to that spindle. So if I add a simple cube, scale it down a bit, apply rotation and scale, we'll make sure it's above our cog and we'll make it physical. So we'll add active. And I'm just going to use this really to add some energy to the system. I press play and fair enough, the cog's spinning and it's going to fall off that spindle at some point. So I could play around with making changes to the shape of this spindle to help retain it, as you'd have to do in real life. But of course, that then makes this geometry more complex. That adds to the complexity of the calculations for Blender and adds to potential for errors creeping in because Blender can only work in finite fractions of time. In the real world, although we think in terms of seconds and milliseconds and microseconds and so on. The reality is time is a continuum. There isn't a finite subdivision of time. At least that's as I understand it. But in the computer world, computers are not infinite. They have a finite amount of memory. So therefore, a simulation of something happening over time is cut up into little pieces, little slices of time. And that's all represented as it happens under the physics settings here. So steps per second means Blender's cutting its simulation up into, in this case, 61 steps for each second. So 61 slices of time. Now the iterations is how many times it goes around and repeats the calculations that it needs to repeat for each thing. Because if you imagine there's three or four or more physical objects interacting, then one object bounces off another. So there's energy being transferred to, from one to the other, but there's an effect on both of them. So in order to calculate how they then move, you have to calculate the movement of one, calculate what happens when it collides with the second one, 
then calculate what happens to the first one after it's transferred energy and so on and so forth. So you have to go round and round and round multiple times and you have to do this currently we're set to 61 times per second. So the reason I got onto that is that Blender's calculations are not perfect. They can't be perfect because you'd need a computer that could do an infinite subdivision of time slices. This would be infinity here. For obvious reasons it can't do that. And because of that there are always errors. It's not a perfect simulation and that's what causes some of the jittering or sometimes things flying off the screen and so on. But we have the tools to keep that under control. So one of the things that will make the whole job a lot easier is actually creating constraints on our physical objects. So what we want to do is constrain the movement of this cog as if it was really fixed to this spindle but with a bearing that allows it to spin. So I'm going to select the gear, select the spindle, so they're both selected so I held shift and right click them both and then if we look in here you can see constraints connect. You can do this in a sort of manual way but this has already been set up for us. So I'm just going to say connect and you'll notice by going to wireframe mode there's a little empty being added with three axes. So I'm going to press play now and let's see what happens. Absolutely nothing. You can see it's still a physical object because the cube bounced off it but it didn't move a millimeter. So with that empty selected which is an indicator of our constraint let's come over to the physics panel and you can see it's called rigid body constraint and the type is currently set to fixed which just means we've joined this object and this object the spindle and the gear together using this constraint and we've set it to fix so there is no movement permitted. So there isn't a bearing per se but the one that we need for this application is called hinge because if you can imagine that a hinge moves flexes or rotates in only one direction and although we all think of a hinge as having a limited range of motion the default hinge actually is unlimited. You can apply limitations to it here but the default one is unlimited so that means it works like a spindle. So okay so we set it to hinge so let's press play now and it's still not rotating except in the wrong direction. So if we go back again you can see it's rotated slightly in that direction. The reason for that is because most of these sorts of constraints rotate around the Z axis. They don't rotate around the X or the Y. So with the constraint selected I'm going to rotate on the X axis 90. So RX 90. So now the Z is pointing along the spindle. So let's press play now and you can see it spins nicely and you can see it's also not wobbling around now. It's spinning just as we'd expect it to. There's no, nothing odd going on at all. And it's got a, a nice run on on the spin as well. And it will slow down and slow down and slow down. So that's excellent. We've got our first gear set up. Something else you will want to do is look at the mass of the objects. Now, I haven't applied any particular measurement system to this. You may want to do that under the units so you may want to set this to metric or imperial, set angles to degrees or radians and obviously metric or imperial for length measurement. So you can have specific sizes and often that is a good idea. What we also haven't done is indicated the mass of these objects. So they're arbitrary at the moment but you can calculate the mass. So if you select say our gear and we say calculate mass we get a load of options come up to say what it might be made of. So let's say bronze for the gear. It doesn't really matter for the spindle because it doesn't move. And then let's select our cube here and we'll calculate the mass for that one as being gold. So it's quite heavy. And we'll press play. And off it goes. So if we look at the rigid body settings now you can see it has a mass of six and a half thousand and our cog has a mass of just under ten thousand. So one other thing worth noting is there is another setting in here called disable collisions. What this disables is collisions between the two objects that are connected by the constraint. Generally speaking you don't want to enable collisions. Occasionally you do. If you had a genuine hinge for example that might flop back against itself you might want to enable collisions between the stationary object and the moving object but you'll generally find it's a less stable simulation. Won't really make much difference here because they're not actually colliding. So generally leave disable collisions on unless you find you need it. Breakable just allows for any impulse greater than a certain threshold to the physical moving object 
will actually break it away from its constraint. So it can actually knock the cog off its constraint, which you may want to do. So we'll just move our cube up there a little bit. Look straight on, go into wireframe, B select, and we'll make a copy of that cog. And we'll move it to here. And just for ease, I'm going to move it down a little bit. I'm going to move my cube over here now. And let's see what happens. And if we, in fact, just to make it easier, make another copy. And we put that one here and put our cube here. Let's see what that does. So I think we didn't hit very well there. There we go. So you can now see they are interacting. They're not passing through each other. And one is moving the other. So that's a very simple cog setup. And how can we do a sliding cog? I'm going to remove that cube name, look from above, put my 3D cursor about there, and we'll add a simple plane. Rotate X90, and we'll just put the plane there so that it's about there. And I just did Control R just to add some extra loops there, and they're nice and central. So I'm just adding some more loops in there, really just doing this by eye. And I'm just going to pull that in there, pull that in there. I'm going to remove these now, I don't need them. So I'm just doing this very simply, scale at zero just to make those straight. And now E and extrude out a little. Next thing I'm going to do is add an array modifier and set it to duplicate on the Y axis. And we'll do quite a few, I think. I think we can afford to make that a little thinner now. And then add a mirror modifier and just bring it together. And I'm going to leave a gap between them, I think. Something like that. We'll give this the steel material and we'll add active. So at the moment, this is just a physical object. It's just going to tumble away, as you see. But let's go to its rigid body physics settings. Convex hull is not good enough for a complex shape like this, so we'll say mesh, and we'll set the margin to 0.001. So it's falling more realistically now. And we'll say calculate mass, and we'll make it iron. And you can see it's just about got enough energy to move the cogs now before it falls away. So we now need some kind of spindle. So I'm going to add a cube, scale that in, put it about there, and then scale on the X. And just for making a bit more convincing, really, I'm going to select all those faces, E, and then extrude out. And then just pull that one out. So it doesn't matter really what's going on behind. Control A, rotation and scale. So I don't know that this spacing is exactly right yet, but let's now create, let's just give that center one a material and then add passive. So you can see it's sort of trying to work there, but of course we've got no constraints. So even if that is the right size, and I'm not sure whether it is or not, if these teeth are the right size, it's just not working. And that's because we've got no constraint. So let's select our slider, let's select its spindle and connect them. So at the moment, absolutely nothing happens, of course. We've got Z already pointing upwards. So let's come over to here with the constraint selected and make this a slider. And let's see what that does. So for the slider, what we really need is to have the X axis pointing down. The x-axis is the direction that the slider works on. So rotate y 90. Now press play. And roughly speaking, the slider's working. It's not quite right. There's obviously a lot of issues there in terms of the alignment of everything. But it's starting to work. So let's set the margin 0 0.001 for the center object. Let's turn the friction down a little bit for the slider. So the reason it suddenly it goes for a while and then suddenly slips through is a simple one. We come over to here 
We've got an array applied, of course. Not only that, we've also got a mirror object applied. And clearly, the rigid body physics is being calculated before the other modifiers are being calculated. So if I now apply the array modifier and the mirror modifier, and now press play, we can see it actually works. See, it's not quite right. There's a little bit of lumpiness to it. Perhaps if we just move it out slightly. And no doubt the size of these very, very crude cogs isn't quite right either. You can see it's sort of moving backwards and forwards a little. But essentially that's working. And I can, of course, copy all of these cogs, bring them over to here, rotate Z 180, and then bring them in. So now Blender is calculating six cogs as well as the slider in the middle. And because of the increased friction, obviously it's taking longer. Now, one of the things you can notice is we're getting to the end of the animation and the, anim the simulation hasn't finished. So let's increase that to 500. And yet it stops. And there's a very simple reason for that. There's no direct connection between the length of your animation and the length of the simulation cache. So in here, we've got rigid body cache. If we look in there, it's defaulted to Blender's default animation length of 250. So let's set that to 500. Go back to the beginning and press play again. And now you can see it's carrying on. And obviously you would want to play around with things like the friction so we can turn that down a bit more. Here's another example where disabling collisions is quite important. If I enable collisions now, you may actually get a few problems with that one. It seems to be all right actually, but because of the way they work, that could well have caused problems. The other thing I can do, of course, is increase the mass of this object to speed it up. So call this 10,000 units. And now there's a lot more energy in it and it gets the cog spinning more quickly. We can add a mesh plane at the bottom. Give that a simple color. Let's turn off the grid floor. At the moment, that slider will just go through it. But just set that to add passive. And then it stops. And again, you can see this little bit of jiggling, which you can deal with by playing around with things like enabling deactivation. Or you can add a tiny little bit of damping as well, which will also basically sap the energy of the system and make it a little less unstable. These are one of the things that you need to deal with. It's, again, like I said, it's to do with the way Blender slices up time and calculates what things are going on. So I hope you found that useful and I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye for now. So I hope you found that interesting. If you did, let me know. If you enjoy these tutorials, don't forget to click like and subscribe. I also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, and I now have a Patreon page as well. And I'll provide links to all of those in the description below. So I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot.